Welcome to The Laws of Style, featuring conversations on creativity, fashion, and the law from the leading edge of our economy and culture. Hosted by noted fashion lawyer, Douglas Hand. Hello. Welcome to The Laws of Style. Downloading to you from the work from home offices of the law firm HBA, high above Central Park at this juncture uh, in Manhattan, New York. I'm your host, Douglas Hand, fashion lawyer, fashion law professor, and self-styled well-dressed man. And I am joined today by good friend, uh, menswear executive and industry veteran, Eric Jennings. Eric, thanks for joining this morning. It's great to be here, Doug. You, uh, for the listeners who may not know, um, were head of menswear at Saks Fifth Avenue for many years. And um, obviously, the state of retail, uh, particularly wholesale accounts, has been decimated, certainly by the COVID pandemic, but, but even before then, it was, um, it was having problems. What do you think of the state of, of retail, and I'm not talking specific brands, but you know, large scale multi-brand retail uh, today, and um, you know, brands relationship with retail accounts given the bankruptcies of Barney's and Neiman Marcus that, that have really hurt certain brands. Yeah, the list good gets longer and longer every day. So who can predict, really who can predict at this point what this is all, when the dust settles, who is gonna be left standing and who is not gonna be left standing? Um, I, you know, I think the state of retail is gonna to have to find that point of equilibrium between brick and mortar and online. There's got to be that, that, that balance. And I think when Eric Buell and I, speaking of Eric, where we're consulting in my time between Saks Fifth Avenue and Peerless Clothing, we, we were speaking to a lot of direct-to-consumer brands and a lot of brick and mortar brands. And each of the brands that we were working with were trying to find that balance. All the D2C brands were like figuring out, how can I build some brick and mortar? All the brick and mortars were like, how can I augment and enhance my, my digital presence? And so at some point there, we'll, we'll, we'll crack the code and figure out what the best formula is. Yeah. Well, I remember that conversation and we talked about, in a sense, what, what you described as, as three pillars of supporting a brand, a direct to consumer channel directly to your consumers and, and controlling that conversation, but was expensive to build out a brick and mortar presence, which is very expensive um, and risky in a sense because of the long-term lease uh, commitments, and then a wholesale right. presence. And I think we wound up, I pressed you guys a bit, and I think you wound up saying, look, those should be roughly equivalent, almost a third, a third, a third in terms of you know, getting it right. Do right. you think that that balance today has shifted given the change in just what, what one can do at retail? In short, yes, it has shifted. And the emphasis is clearly now during a pandemic to online sales. It has to be, there's just stores are closed. So for sure that dynamic has, has changed and, and it is, the focus really is on online sales right now. And then as we come out of this, it's like, how can you enhance that brick and mortar? How much brick and mortar do you need? You know, how, how why do you need to be, these stores need to be across the country? Or do you need to have one amazing flagship and have that represent the essence of your brand, your values, your DNA. Yeah. And let people experience that in its fullness. And then everybody else can, can get a glimpse of that on your website and, and, and purchase online. So, But let's talk about your role at Peerless. So you are the creative director at Peerless, which for those that don't know, is really just the apex of, of men's tailored clothing uh, in terms of number of brands. Um, and you know, I'll let you talk about quality of brands and maybe you know, just articulate some of them and perhaps the price points um, and customer segmentation that they represent. Sure. So Peerless Clothing International, 100-year-old company based in Montreal. And we are the largest manufacturer of uh, men's and boys tailored clothing in North America. You may have heard a few of our brands like Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, Ralph Lauren, uh, let's see, Michael Kors, Hart Schafter and Marks, DKNY, Robert Graham, Van Heusen, and then there's, and there's a, a whole bunch more. We do Todd Snyder's, we do his, Todd, his, um, his tailored clothing. 
uh, Michael Strahan, Sean John, Shaquille uh, O'Neal. So all these, you know, very recognizable household names. We're definitely in that mass market sector, which is very different from my background at Saks Fifth Avenue. It's when I when I see the numbers of what we do here at this company, it's it's, it's mind boggling to me. Um, but the brands, you know, I would say the brands start at maybe three hundred dollars for a suit and top out at thirteen hundred dollars. Okay. And what is that thirteen hundred dollar proposition? Is that Talia or is that? Uh... I guess educate me. I'm not. I'm not sure in terms of those brands, which one um, is your top out brand? So Heart Shafter and Marks would be would be our, our top of line. So Heart Shafter and Marks from Chicago, uh, made in the USA, still made in the USA. Uh, many of their product categories in the factory there. Uh, that's our only brand where we do made to measure. Okay. And then uh, Robert Graham is on the on the upper upper end of that. We have our Italia brand. So we have two proprietary brands. One is Talia which is uh, a brand that is more fashion forward, more contemporary, bold attitude. And then we have a, another proprietary brand called Taylor Red, which was also at the top end of our offering, which is made in, in our factory in Montreal. And so that would be again in that thousand dollar price point. So again, from Van Heusen uh, at Kohl's and, and JC Penney's to you know, Nordstrom, uh, Bloomingdale's, those, those from, so anywhere, you know, in that spectrum. Right, right. Well, while you were at Saks and before the pandemic, but certainly during a time of, of increased business casualization, you yes. were, I thought, the smartest guy in the room who shot out a newsletter regularly from Saks, educating men on how to dress business casual, but smart, um, you know, and look professional while in a business casual environment. Um, <laughs> you know, now the business casual environment is, is your bedroom or your TV room or your living room, wherever you are Zooming from. Yeah, How no, I see people talking from pantries, from bathrooms, I mean, wherever they can find a corner. Uh, right, so with the new work, work from home, you know, sort of requirements on, on a lot of professionals, who used to wear tailored clothing or, or wore tailored clothing, how, how are you looking at that, both as a creative director um, and just as a, as a guy who obviously Zooms, you know, probably 15 times a day himself? Yeah. Well, it's, what happened was, in, in, when it, I guess it was 2016, was when the Wall Street Journal ran this article that all these big Wall Street firms were going business casual. And of course, everybody loves the headline, suits are dead, suits are dead, you know, the death of suits. I've been hearing that for 25 years. Um, but it never happens. Suits never die. Tailored clothing never dies. It's not going to die. It's just will morph into something different depending on what the needs are at that time. But when the article came out in the Wall Street Journal, I, I just Googled, like, how many employees do each of these firms have? And when I added it all up, it was like, you know, let's say a million people. And I'm thinking, gosh, well, if a million people out there are now starting to dress casual, how can we help them look appropriate, put together, polished, professional, but in a way that's more casual? I think that is just as relevant today in 2020 as it was back then when the banks went all went business casual. So we came up with, and actually, this is funny. Initially, I came up with the do, do's and don'ts list. This is what you do do, this is what you don't do. And we were gonna give it a, uh, a try with our, within our own, uh, the matrix of stores. So we did all this training, I did a video, we sent out the newsletter, we did the do's and don'ts. And I remember that very first weekend was the first weekend that we were gonna let the, guy, the men working in the fleet of stores across the country dress business casual, the way I had instructed them. Kind of a debacle. So we had to pump the brakes on that and rethink our messaging. And so we ended up coming up um, with this kind of seven point high level manual. It was called the new office man manual. And again, like thinking about the new office back then and then what the new office looks like today, you know, it could be a pantry, it could be a bathroom, it could be a train, it could be an airplane, it could be a, um, you know, a cafe down the street, you know, it could be really anywhere. So. How are we going to look intelligent? Are you going to look professional? 
what does that what does that look like and i think it's still something that men have a hard time with i think women have a much easier time with it but men struggle with it because the suit is just that easy uniform there's not much thinking involved in a suit whereas when you're matching colors and matching patterns and matching you know textures and weights and seasonality you just have to factor in more things and it's just not part of the american culture male culture you, we're just not grown up like the italian men that are educated from a very early age from their grandfathers and their fathers on how to put it all together in a way that's stylish and cool well and maybe that it's fun to do that that there is some yeah, interesting yourself. calculus to go through each morning as you get dressed or in the evening if you're going to go out and you're going to dress up that that process can actually be an enjoyable one and can be one where it's per it's not artistic per se but i mean there there are choices that are going to impact your whole personal presentation and personal Absolutely. presentation is a very, very important thing, obviously in business and law. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I read, I read those pamphlets with interest. Um, one, to make sure that there were no copyright violations on the laws of style, that you weren't just lifting my text, uh, <laughs> which of course you weren't. Um, but to the laws of style, which I know you've read cover to cover, is there I any one- I didn't have a last time knowing that I would be talking to you. So I did go to the appendix and okay. reread Appendix A, the, the actual the, the laws actual laws appendix. where if you want the, the, the shorthand, um, you know, of them, which one or, or more really resonated with you as, as a good guidepost for men or just for you personally? Well, for me, it's always been about fit uh, and knowing your fit, knowing what cuts look best on your body. That's always been sort of at the top of, of my of my things to, to, to keep in mind when I'm getting dressed. You mentioned in the laws about knowing your tailor and your cleaner, having a first name basis with them. And I have always had, especially when I was at, at Saks Fifth Avenue, when, we, when I had a tailor right across the street from my office, you know, having, being able to text message with a tailor that could help out um, in all of my tailoring needs, whether it was a, a brand new made to measure suit or getting something fixed. Um, I, I still know my tailor down the street uh, on a first name basis and, and making sure that things are always, the buttons are, are, are on tightly and, and if there's, you know, anything has happened that, that, that it looks in good shape. Um, what was the other one? Oh, about not, or about taking business casual seriously. I think you, I think you said, don't take. Don't take business don't casual take business casually. casually. Yeah. Casually, yeah. So, in other words, take business casual seriously. Let's 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 put the spin on that. Yeah. Um, take it seriously. Even when you are dressing more casually, don't look sloppy. Don't look slumpy. I think it it behooves you to take it seriously because it's harder. You know, yeah. the, 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 your suiting options are are in a sense gar animals. They're going to cover eighty percent of your visual presentation with the same either pattern or you know color. And the only choices you really have to make are, you know, your, your accessories and, and your shirt and perhaps a tie. Although I find men are, are rarely wearing the tie these days, even, you know, at, at high levels of business and law and finance. Um, maybe, I mean, while we're on the subject, what do you think about that? Does your company make ties, obviously, as, as sort of adjacent to the suits? And what do you think of the tie business going forward? Is it is it nearly dead? Will it be in a crypt? I, I have to be honest, I'm not a fan of the tie. Uh, I am a fan of the pocket square though. If I could just, if we could somehow just let the tie go its way or, or do what it's gonna do and put that love into, into the pocket square. I think that would be a good thing. I, I think guys respond to what has some utility to it in terms of, I mean, the pocket square of perhaps dubious utility, but you can blow your nose in it. You can be that gallant guy who pulls it out and offers it to someone who's crying, you know? I mean, the tie stems from actual soldiers who wore a cravat and mm -hmm. used it to kind of wipe their face down or wipe blood off their face for all I know. And a king, I'm gonna forget the name, it may have been George VIII, um, thought 
thought they looked really good. These were Serbian soldiers and adopted it for his troops. And it just proliferated in that way and became part of court dress. And yes. now it's a, it's a business norm, although as you rightly point out, much, much less so. Um, I remember pre-pandemic, I used to, my commutes took me usually up Park Avenue through sort of that main finance corridor um, and often down Fifth. And I used to count how many men were in suits, full suits, tieless, and it always was more men in that mode in a suit, just, just suited men, versus those that had a suit and tie, which I found flabbergasting. Really. <laughs> yeah. I think it's interesting now, too. Um, my new commute to, to work involved jumping on city bike and riding up the West Side Highway and then across 52nd Street, across town. And it's like a 20-minute roller coaster ride uh, on my way to work, which I love. But what I found is that obviously there's not a lot of people wearing suits anymore. So I don't see that entry level suit out on the street anymore, but I have been seeing men in suits and ties recently. And it's, and I use, it really stops you in your track and you wonder who is that guy? Where is he going? He looks so great. Am I going to dress like that again? Like, it's, I find it very inspiring and it really will stop you in your tracks now when you see a guy in a suit and I, and I love that and I love, it just speaks to the power of tailored clothing. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I, I think part of that can be attributed to our economy is certainly in some sectors struggling. And so you do find men who are either nervous about their jobs or searching for a job, um, dressing more formally um mm -hmm. you know I, I think it never hurts to, to to dress formally even if you're very secure in your job but um but but there may be a bit of that um as well as going outside you know the sense of occasion in going outside is mm -hmm. is now novel after you know someone like you who spent so much time inside uh during the pandemic and 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 sort of you know relegated to one city um so did you ever did you ever, when you started going on the Zoom calls, were you ever the guy that wore a jacket and boxer shorts or, you know, a tie and sweatpants because you were only, you were only, you know, being shown well, from here up? That brings up a very interesting subject, sort of, you know, the, the, the now primacy of, of just the top up presentation. I mean, today um, I am wearing pants, I assure you, but I am wearing an odd jacket because I find the suit for Zoom calls a little, a little silly in that, you know, no one's gonna see my bottom half. And so suiting yeah. up, unless I'm going out after the Zoom call, is, is a little false. And it's not that my suit mm -hmm. bottoms are, um, you know, uncomfortable. It's just that um, an odd jacket feels a little more fun to me. And yeah. since, you know, since the Zoom environment also kind of de-emphasizes a lot. I mean, you know, this jacket, I normally would only wear to like a party, but it's very de-emphasized on camera, particularly on Zoom camera, I think. So it takes a lot to really produce an affront to your viewer. Um, but I think, you know, you need a lot to at least have any visual interest. Um, and, you know, as a guy who just cares about how I dress and sometimes there's an expectation I'm gonna be dressed in a certain way at this point, um, yeah, you know, I've actually gone a little bit more like to your Rantalia type, um, odd jackets and, you know, I mean, my tie, actually my mother knit and I, oh, she, yeah, I yeah. I, I've been telling her to go to, go into business for years. She's a fantastic I knitter. Be a Drake's, Drake's tie, knit tie or, <laughs> or Charvé maybe. She may be the only tie purveyor left if I get her into business. Give me her number. Maybe I'll shoot her an email. But what do you think about that sort of the um, top, you know, top only? Has that changed the way Peerless is looking at its tailored clothing? And uh, is there more of a primacy to the odd jacket over the suit? Well, what's interesting actually in our business, from what I'm hearing, is that um, bottoms are selling. Trousers, dress trousers are actually selling right now, which is interesting because you would think, oh, people would be wanting the top half because that's what, that's what we're showing is the top half. But actually, trousers are selling. I'll tell you though, from this is maybe just revealing how weird I am, but even when I was, so I was furloughed for five weeks initially as, as, we, as many people were. 
And even during that time, I would get up, do my morning routine, exercise, meditate, whatever that, you know, that, that looks like. And then I would shower and get dressed head to toe. And I would even put on shoes and, and then mentally start my day, even though I was, you know, you know, doing other things rather than work things at that time, just because mentally for me, it just put me in that, in the right frame of mind. Yeah. Another example is when we do photo shoots, um, a lot of time when we're shooting for .com, we're only shooting our jackets. And we have a photo studio outside my office. And when we shoot them, they would, I would notice that they would just be, bring, they, would, they would show me the looks, I would approve it, bless it, then they'd go in the room and shoot it. And I'd always make sure that the models had shoes on, just because I think, again, that, that mental state of mind, that emotional, like you hold yourself differently when you have, when you're dressed with shoes, trousers, and the jacket, like it's all part of that, the package that makes you stand a certain way and present yourself a certain way. So yeah, for me, the, it's, it's, it's all part of that, that confidence that you get when you, when you are dressed head to toe. Yeah. Well, so you are a West Coast guy like me. Um, yeah. And we've been North here. North Southern, you're Southern, right? I'm SoCal and, and you are yeah, no so Cal. I'm no Cal. Cal. Yeah. And, and, and definitely a difference there. Um, but not so much as, you know, sort of the California, the Northeast, right? Um, and we've been here a long time. But, you know, I'm always, when I do go back to California and, and I dress, I, I find it very challenging. I find it, you know, it is so casual. Again, I'm mainly in L.A. And I know San Francisco is yeah. slightly different. Although with the advent of the tech industry and the primacy of that industry to that town, I, I might argue that San Francisco actually looks even more schlumpy than Los Angeles um, from yeah. time to time, because at least the film and, and Hollywood, you know, they do their, their odd red carpet events where they do care about how they dress. But maybe just comment for me about, you know, how you have found West Coast style versus East Coast style. I mean, you deal with it personally because you're from both coasts, but you also deal with it because you're with a, a, a global brand, which sells mainly in the U.S. So let's talk East, let's, let's talk SoCal, NoCal, because I was born in LA and then moved quite young to NoCal, Northern California, Bay Area. And so I have family and friends in down South. And then of course I grew up in, in Northern California. And I would say, you know, Southern California is a little bit more rock and roll, all saintsy. Yeah. And Northern California was much more granola, bohemian, casual, obviously much more casual on the West Coast in general than on the East Coast. And I remember growing up in high school in the 80s. And actually, this is a funny, this is funny. Somebody just found a video. I used to go on this dance show, TV20 um, San Francisco dance party. And they found a video of me dancing on this show in the mid 80s. And I'm looking at what I was wearing. And I remember at the time, there was this the preppy handbook. And I remember being, being, being being obsessed with the preppy handbook and that whole East Coast, Northeast style. Yeah. And so there was kind of a, a moment in my life where I was dressing like kind of preppy um, from what I learned from the book, but then infusing it with like this kind of skateboard, vans, ocean Pacific uh, surfer look from Southern California, kind of a surf punk right. vibe, mixing that with kind of a preppy East Coast vibe. And so I, I kind of, as I saw this video of myself dancing, like <laughs> from the 1980s on a TV show, I was cracking up because I could see in my mind exactly what I was trying to, the, the look that I was going for. Yeah. Well, I, I think you hit on what a lot of micro brands kind of uh, have done that are successful. I think of when you, when you mentioned that kind of convergence of styles, I thought immediately of rowing blazers, which um, started actually from, from a well-researched book from a former coxswain, Jack Carlson, who's been on The Laws of Style. Um, and it was very specific to the rowing blazer as an item yeah. and, and the legacy of it, et cetera. It was such a successful book and he had done so much research that he actually started a company making just yes. rowing blazers. But from yes. that, and from that one iconic item, he is making everything now. I mean, he's making rugby shirts and tennis outfits and all on the sort of prep, you know, prep also was very sporty, 
It was kind of, this is what the Northeastern wealthy wasps wear when at play, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so he's riffed on that, but his customer base, while there are some gentlemen, older gentlemen who, who, who wear the stuff without any irony, he's also yeah. got skateboarders and he's got urban hip hop folks and he's got, you know, uh, Japanese, the Japanese love it. I personally love what Rolling Blazers is doing. I've had some very interesting conversations with Jack and the, and the company, and there's clearly synergies between what they're doing and what we do, our core competencies and what, and what they're doing. And I think, again, they've made this very singular item and they've expanded on that and they've opened the door. So it's not just one type of person that, is wearing their products. It really is open. And I think when we were talking about the D2C brands and, and the brick and mortar, what they did with their pop-up, when you see the store down in the East Village or Nolita in that area, it's on the corner and it's got these, these open glass windows. So you can see inside, you can see the color, you can see the energy, you can see what's going on. They, they host events throughout the week. And so it's got this, is just, it's like- it, it, Clubhouse. It, people in from the neighborhood and it's become a, a, a community place to hang out and they've got great product and they and it's fresh and it's new and there's always something happening in the store and I think what they're doing is absolutely genius but it's all based in this core passion for the roaming blazer yeah. and what that really means and how you can reinterpret it today. So so Jack is a great story of a, of a small brand organically grown. Um, you and I first met because we were mentors uh, at the CFDA incubator back when that was still uh, alive and kicking. And we, we mentored many small brands that came through that incubator over the years. Um, despite Jack's success and the success of some, you know, some, some new brands, I think it, it's becoming harder than ever for new brands to launch, despite the fact that, that direct to consumer does permit uh, a brand to engage directly with consumers and enjoy a massive margin because they're not selling to wholesale accounts. I say that because to now get those consumers, you're competing with everybody, with the big boys included. And so gaining those eyeballs is so expensive and developing that website is, is not as expensive, but still expensive. Um, that it's harder forever for, for the small brands to compete. You know, it used to be, you, you know this from, from, you know, you've known this forever. If you were a successful designer and had a desirable design, even if all you had funded were the sample production of that design and you shot a lookbook or you really scraped together and got some warehouse downtown and had a show, if the right people liked it, you get orders and with those orders, with that AR, you could fund the production and actually really kind of launch as a global brand. And that's what a lot of kids did out of design school, you know, back in the early aughts, we saw that. I don't think we are gonna see that anytime soon, but just your thoughts on that. Do you think that, that new brands are really going to be further and farther between or is there a new economy that permits new brands to thrive? Well, first of all, I love the CFDA incubator program and I love nothing more than mentoring new brands and nurturing new brands and taking my experience working with big global brands and helping a young brand to start. And, and, I, and I miss those days. Um, I actually love speaking at your class um, to the students because I love the passion in their eyes and I, and, uh, and their, 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 their interest and engagement in this, in this industry. So uh, it is difficult now for new brands to get started. And it is bloody expensive to get your brand to the top of the search, to, to get in front of the right eyeballs. And again, I, I, as, the, as I was consulting with a lot of D2C brands, they were all trying to figure out how much wholesale do I, I they're like, how can I, how can I get a little wholesale business in there? And how can I find an affordable way to, to, to build a brick and mortar flagship store? Uh, it is not easy. And I know if you don't have investors with deep pockets that are gonna be patient, it's, it's very difficult because I know a lot of 
brands, young brands that had an initial shot of, of capital in the beginning, when that dried up, they were like out the door, left on the street to, to, to defend for themselves. And that's, that's difficult because of the way the system is set up. It's not set up to sustain and nurture new businesses over the long term. Well, one way that we've seen it, uh, that we've seen new brands, you know, have that initial success and, and in some cases lasting success is, is the rise really of the, the influencer economy, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. Having a built-in customer base because of, of online success or online presence, online eyeballs, is, uh, is, is a pretty good recipe, it turns out. Is that similar to what you do with the Shaquille O'Neal line and the Strahan line? Is that, is that sort of a, a branch of the same tree or do you view those lines um, as, as different from sort of personality backed um, apparel? Yeah, no, I think that having the right collaborators working together is, is extremely important. Having the right influencers is extremely important, I think. Right now, sports marketing, I, I, and, and I've been a big fan of sports marketing for, for many, many years, and I've done, you know, worked with a lot of top athletes uh, throughout the last eight years or so. And I think it's, it's all part of this, this, this formula of finding the right influencers, having the right partnerships, the right collaborators working together that have shared values, that's when, it, that's when it really works. Yeah. Well, related perhaps is um, the collaboration proliferation, right? The weekly, the weekly spill of, of who's collaborating with whom um, to create a media moment, to create some interest, and perhaps if they're, if they're different markets being represented to you know, to dip a toe in that market and, and gain some exposure in a market that, that one brand is not in. And hopefully for both brands, it's, it's, it's mutual. Um, do you at Peerless with any of the brands do collaborations or is that, is that something verboten and it's kind of the brands themselves stand alone? Well, we work very closely with the brand headquarters, whether it's a Calvin Klein partnership, which we did with Iman Schubert, uh, NBA All-Star, or um, Tim Anderson with Hart Schafter and Marks from the Chicago, from the White Sox, you know, we're working very closely, closely with the brand headquarters on vetting out who the right partnerships are going to be. Ultimately, they'll make that decision and then we'll, we'll run with it and, and create a marketing campaign out of that. Um, so yeah, there's definitely something that I, I feel like it, it still works very well, but it's got to be authentic. I look at rowing, going back to rowing blazers, partnering with, with Fila, thought that was a great authentic partnership. I love the partnership with Gucci and Dapper Dan. Like how phenomenal was that, uh, is that partnership? Um, and again, when it's, when it's genuine and there's a sense of shared values, then it's highly, highly effective. You know, when I joined Saks about 12 years ago, it was at the beginning of that hashtag menswear moment, the street style, got uh, Schumann doing the, the sartorialist, doing these street style shots. And, and I remember those street style stars from back in the day had a very clear point of view and style. And then something happened. As, as they got bigger and people were sort of throwing clothes their way, I found a disconnect happening where it was all of a sudden became very obvious that they weren't wearing their real clothes that they were had in their closet. They were putting on somebody else's look and it looked costumey. It didn't look genuine. It didn't look authentic, which I think are two words that, that get overused a bit. But then I thought, wow, they've kind of like, what's the, the, uh, the, when the uh, jumping the shark? What's the, you know, when you, when you, know, when you, when you kind of, yes. Yeah, Fonzie jumping the shark, like that was the end of happy days. Right. You know? And that's kind of what happened to, to an extent with the, with the influencer I, phenomenon. I think that's right in, in hashtag menswear because, and I don't want to, you know, is, is probably you and I are part of that community broadly considered. I don't want to elevate the, the knowledge base there, but I think it was a pretty informed group such that yeah. when they saw... And I won't pick on Nick Wooster or anybody like that, but let's just say a Nick Wooster wearing something that they 
didn't think fit. And it was, it was a promotion that they sort of called foul. Whereas a Kylie Jenner or a certain other influencers, perhaps that community is not so discerning and doesn't care so much about that integrity. If she's endorsing it, she's endorsing it. And I love, 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 love her. <laughs> and I'll buy it. Uh, because some influencers have really elevated to, you know, to, to that kind of iconic status where, you know, let's face it, in the case of, I think it's Kylie, she's a billionaire on paper yeah. uh, on the basis of her cosmetics line. Um, mm -hmm. So, but on cosmetics, I, I've always meant to ask, Eric, and this is not a cosmetics question. This is more of a skincare question. You know, you and I are roughly the same vintage. You know, I can see you dancing in the 80s. I probably had like Mossimo bright green shorts on and I was dancing somewhere in the background too. Um, your skin, your face, you just, you have this youthfulness that is undeniable. Is there some skincare regimen that you go through that you are comfortable sharing with, with the listeners? Yeah, I've always been, I've always been very conscientious of my skin. I on to be honest with you, I think Good skin does not run in my family. And I think as a, an impressionable young child, I saw some kind of bad skin, skin in my family, relatives or whatnot. And so just from a young age, I was just really careful about taking care of my skin. And I went through this phase at Saks where I, that whole, remember that Korean skincare phenomenon with that right. Korean face mask and I would use the Clarisonic, you know, and, and now I'm, I think there's one thing that the pandemic has done working from home is I, I spend a lot less time on, on skincare, but I do, you know, uh, wash it, tone it, moisturize, put a sunscreen on every single day. Um, I think honestly, I have naturally oily skin. <laughs> and so- Well, but that's um, good. That's, I think the scientists would tell us that's good. Yeah, and I keep on, I keep on waiting for, my skin to change like i waited for years for for like the ability to, to grow a beard that just never happened uh and i waited for my skin to change and i and I, I still feel like i have teenage teenage oily skin and and i still can't quite grow a beard although i did try during the during the first few months of the pandemic I, yeah, I, and i i saw your instagram feed and i thought i thought it was more mustache than uh, than beard you know, because, because this was like a like bright brown and then this was kind of white. <laughs> so so it kind of looked more mustachy. But I, I remember the first time I posted a picture with with like when you know you could see my face, like there was such a reaction because no one had actually ever, ever seen me with facial hair before. Um, and then I decided after Labor Day I would get rid of it. But I look at you and you've got great skin too, but you're able to grow a beard and then get rid of it and then grow a mustache and then get rid of it. And then one, one time I see you your head shaved and then the next time you've got this great wave on top. So I, I am a little envious. I, of your I, I try to play around with it. I try to play around with it. Last question, uh, because you brought it up and I think it is germane to, to today's, um, you know, today's questions about how we present ourselves. Um, what is your mask? Regimen. What, what do you, you know, when, when you step outside in that outfit, do you have just a, I mean, obviously every mask should deal with the medical essentials of a mask and, and preventing both, you know, exhalation and, 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 and germs from coming in. But um, do you have a mask game that you're comfortable sharing in terms of how you like the color and or texture to work with your ensemble? That's so interesting. And I didn't know you were going to ask me about this, but... I'm going to show you something that nobody has seen, <laughs> except for very few people. But usually, what we were we had been working on was like menswear masks, so herringbones, tweeds, plaids. I don't know if you can see this stuff, but like reversible masks that you can actually double as a pocket square. Right, and then it's um, got the wire here, right, and it has a pocket if you want to put a filter, and it's two ply cotton and reversible. So, what I do is I have a stack of these on this on my entryway, and I put it on, 
before I leave the apartment and then I throw it in the washer when I come home. So that, that is my mask game. And it's funny because I've got like a whole stack of these type of masks um, just on the entryway. So it's the last thing I do before I leave the house. And then the first thing I do when I come home is I take it off. But there's always like a stack of these, of these masks that are um, very kind of men's wear -y. Yeah. That, I, that I wear, and then I just stick it as a, as a pocket square. because so I wanted to dress up for you, but, um, but this is kind of what I'm doing. You know, it, apropos of our discussion on the death of the tie or not, you know, I do think I have a personal rule about how many patterns I can have going on at once, right? So if I have a tie on, it usually does have a pattern. And if I'm with one of those masks, now, I'm, now I've got a bad situation, so maybe, the fact that, that we may be wearing masks with patterns on them um, or textures may, may really, you know, sort of be the final death knell of the tie for a lot of guys because I think it looks objectively wrong to have, you know, conflicting patterns so close together. Yeah, that's why we, we wanted to create something that had like men's wear -y patterns on there. Because I think I, eventually I will get back on a subway. I have not been on a subway. And I think people will be going back into the office. They will be wearing tailored clothing more often. And I think so many of the masks right now are kind of cute and novelty or, or like gimmicky or boring and black. I'm like, well, how can we create masks that guys would want to wear when they're wearing tailored clothing? And what's going to look nice when you're wearing a nice jacket like you have on or, or a suit or something. So um, that's kind of what I was looking for as just a guy living in New York City during a pandemic. Um, and, and I think it's not gonna go away. I think the mask will be here to stay at least for the next year, year and a half. And I don't think there'll be shame around wearing a mask even when the pandemic is over. I think it, show, it is a sign of respect. That's something that's definitely been drilled into our head from Governor Cuomo and for everyone who lives here in the state. It is a sign of respect and there's no shame in, in having that and wearing it. So I think it will be, just like in Asia, it's, it's perfectly normal and fine and respectable to, to wear a mask, so. Well, that's great and totally not staged. Um, Eric, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I can't wait to see you in person uh, soon. Person. And uh, yeah. I will get a date on the calendar for you to speak to my class on Monday night, albeit it will be on Zoom. But, uh, but, but okay. they love you as much as you love them. So we'll look forward so to it. So good to see you, sending you a, a virtual hug, elbow bump, all that good stuff. All right. Take care. And thanks, everybody, Take for care. listening. Bye now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Laws of Style with Douglas Hand. For more information, go to our website, at www.hballp.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at, at Hand of the Law. Thank you for tuning in and stay stylish.